Here we go with another rabble rouser of a better than video for you guys. I'm James Reeves. I'm an AR guy, but today on TFB TV, we're talking about what might be the top SHTF Tiatawaki bullpup. The six reasons why the Tavor X95, aka the Micro Tavor, is better than the AR15. Over the years with TFB TV, I've become a little more bullpup curious. Initially, I suffered from bull prejudice, mainly because Europeans like the bullpup so much. And if Europeans think it's good, I just automatically assume it's going to be weird and gross, like Nutella or Speedos. But I judged a great platform well before I really had the chance to use it. And now, bullpups make me Nutella my Speedos. A tale as old as time. I watched Die Hard for like the 23rd time, and I got an irrational but irresistible boner for the Styrog. I know many of you have been there. I bought the NATO Mag version for myself as a Die Hard month gift, or as some households say, Christmas present. First trip to the range, and mother of Glock, I was absolutely hooked. You mean to tell me that this whole time, I could have had a gun that has the capabilities of a 16 or 18 inch barrel air 15, but in a package the size of an MP5, I was pretty much blown away. Next thing you know, I've got an HS product VHS2, I refuse to call it a Hellion, I've got a P90, after my videos on the AUG and the VHS, you all asked for a Tavor review. A Tavor view. Honestly, I didn't want to do this. After all, I had already reviewed a bunch of other similar bullpups in the past, but I'd done videos on the Tavor at SHOT Show. I think Alex maybe reviewed a Tavor back in the day on the channel, so I felt like I was kind of beating a dead horse, like we had tread that ground already. That said, I really have a thing for SBRs or short-barreled rifles, that is, rifles with barrels under 16 inches here in the United States. So when IWI asked me if I wanted to review the new X95 Micro Tavor with the 13-inch barrel conversion kit, there was absolutely no way I was saying no to that. We're not going to lead in with the best reason, but the first should be a historical reason. It's battle proven and it's been refined to work in real life Mad Max conditions better than the M4, at least according to the IDF, the Israeli Defense Forces. So the Tavor comes out in the 90s, almost 30 years ago. The Israelis' battlefields, often the arid plains of the Middle East, so they've driven innovation in small arms suited for desert warfare. After the FALs that the IDF first started with performed, not as well as hoped in the desert, the Israelis realized that the AK-47s used by their adversaries excelled in this environment. So they take the AK-47, they make it better, and they designed the ultra-reliable Galil. As the legendary original Galil aged, it started to show its weaknesses. Reliable as it was, it was heavy, not very modular. The ever-popular M4 began to be issued instead, and it served alongside the Galil. However, IWI wanted to develop a rifle that would work better in confined spaces than the M4, such as in buildings and vehicles, while maintaining AK-47-like reliability, along with that M4 performance and modularity. In 1995, IWI makes the Tavor, and in 2001, IDF starts field testing the TAR-21 version, the original version. According to official IDF field testing, including use in actual combat, the Tavor was more reliable and more accurate than the issued M4s in Israeli terrain. To be fair, this data hasn't been made public to my knowledge, so some skepticism is probably warranted here, but to its credit, it was adopted as the official rifle of the IDF in 2003, set to replace the M4, although the M4 never really went away. The original TAR-21 Tavor was good, but IWI believed it could be better. Over the years, IWI made improvements to the Tavor based on operator feedback, culminating in the X95 variant, which I'm reviewing today. And by the way, all of the X95s, regardless of barrel length, that is 16, 13, or 18 inch barrel length, they're still all called the Micro Tavor since they're a smaller version 
of the original TAR-21. The X95 was officially adopted in 2009, and it's still being used by the IDF today. Now, if I really want a hard-use review of a rifle, I bring it out to Thunder Ranch. During an urban rifle course, you run through 1,000 rounds of 5.56 easily, not to mention you run them on the flat range, you run them on a precision rifle range, you can run them through the Punisher, which is Clint's personally designed cover and concealment course, and you can even run it through the jungle run in the Oregon woods. I guess a forest run, right? It's a great way to test out the gun in a variety of different scenarios. So I bring the Micro DeVore to the ranch with a suppressor. The new Dead Air Sierra 5 did a separate video on the Sierra 5. I was impressed with its performance on the DeVore as well as on an M4. It's a great option for the Micro DeVore because it's tough as nails construction. Means that there are no barrel length restrictions, which is a thing with other suppressors. It can even handle full auto fire out of a short barrel. As usual, didn't clean or lube this gun before or during testing, and it performed flawlessly, suppressed and unsuppressed. In fact, we ran it so hard with the suppressor that we had a little bit of carbon lockup trying to remove the suppressor from the barrel. All that hard work, the micro still didn't break a sweat. The suppressor was a little bit of a bitch to install because when you change the muzzle device, IWI uses this weird mounting thing from the factory where it's like, you actually have to counter twist two wrenches, one to screw the brake on and then the other one to kind of force this little nut towards the muzzle device. I guess it works pretty well for timing, but it did make installation a little bit of a pain. Holy shit. Whoa. I went with the Dead Air Xeno mount. I was really happy with it. Again, I thought the Sierra 5, one of the best deals in the market right now for a 5.56 dedicated can. If you want the best price on it, make sure to see our sponsor, Silencer Shop, to go get one. I'm not kidding. Even though they are a sponsor, they probably will have the best price and they'll help you do your ATF paperwork too through one of the Silencer Shop kiosks. But as you can see here, we ran this gun to the point where the flash hider looked like it spent two weeks in the Jolly Green Giant's ass crack, and we still, like I said, had no failures of any kind at all. The Tavor gets this allegedly better than the M4 reliability from the long stroke piston system. It borrows from the AK-47. Long stroke piston guns, where the gas piston is actually a part of the bolt carrier instead of a separate component, it's considered to be more tolerant of adverse conditions than the AR-15's direct impingement system. The Israelis used the long stroke piston design in the original Galil, but they also integrated it into their 21st century designs, including the Tavor, of course, and the Galil Ace. Not only did they sandproof the gun, but they actually waterproofed it too, so it's over the beach ready and it won't be affected by submersion in water. Unfortunately, all of this makes the Galil heavier than the AR-15. A downside of the AK-type long stroke piston system and the longer barrel is additional weight. Even though the chassis is all polymer and the upper receiver is actually a lightweight, hard anodized machined aluminum, the Tavor is one thick bitch. All the main components, such as the bolt carrier group, the fire control group, the mag catch, and of course the barrel, steel. The Tavor weighs seven and a half pounds naked, which is almost two pounds heavier than the 5.7 pound Mark 18, but not so fast, my fellow AR guys. The bullpup chassis places the center of gravity closer to the shooter than the AR, making the gun less fatiguing to handle. One of my first encounters with the Galil was when the X95 was first released to the US market at SHOT Show 2016. I was one of the first guys to get to shoot it. IWI was proud to show off how easy the bullpup is to shoot one-handed, so that weight actually doesn't make as much of a difference as you might think. Reason number one, proven reliability. Reason number two, this is the big one, or the small one, I, I guess how you look at it. The 13-inch Micro Tavor is more compact than anything else out there and in the AR platform. It's a bullpup, meaning that the chamber is here behind the grip, so even a Tavor with a 16 and a half inch barrel is gonna be four inches shorter than a fully collapsed M4 with a 14 and a half inch barrel. The ultimate entry weapon for US tier one operators is the Mark 18 I have here. It's very compact with a 10.3 inch barrel and overall length of just 27 inches. But the Micro Tavor with the 13 inch barrel, not only does it have three extra inches of barrel, but it's four inches shorter overall than the Mark 18. Just have a look at that, amazing, isn't it? But 
You might say that the AR-15 has better ergos and handling than a bullpup does, and I may not disagree with you, but the X-95 does have great ergos and handling for a bullpup. Utilizing soldier feedback, the X-95 added user experience improvements to the TAR-21, such as a five to six pound trigger. Bullpups have famously shitty triggers because they use an extended trigger bar to release the sear, but the Tavors is pretty good for what it is right out of the box. Still a little mushy, you can hear that right there, and a little bit slow with the reset. But you can fix that. Geisley actually makes an upgraded two-stage trigger for the Tavor that's fantastic. According to a review from our sister publication, Outdoor Hub, the trigger upgrade from Geisley feels just like the famous Geisley SSA trigger in an AR-15. But my favorite X95 upgrade is the Ambi mag release, which was moved to the same spot as the AR-15's mag release. It's funky going from the AR to the bullpup already. Most bullpups have mag releases in weird places, but the X95 places the mag release right where it is on an AR, so it's intuitive, it's easy, especially if the AR-15 manual of arms is already burned into your subconscious, like that one time you trombone farted during a work Zoom meeting and realized your mic wasn't off. You deploy with your trigger finger, and the magazine drops out. You insert a new magazine, and then with your thumb here, support thumb, boom. You can smash the bolt release button right behind the mag well, and you're back in business pretty quick. Certainly better than systems like the HKG-36 or even the NATO mag version of the AUG itself, which doesn't have a last round bolt hold open. Speaking of NATO mags, of course the X95 accepts Stainag or AR-15 type magazines, not proprietary mags like the standard AUG or the G36. Now let's get to reason number three, better terminal performance. Than the Mark 18. The extra three inches of barrel on this Micro Tavor SBR is more important than you know. This is critical with 5.56 because, like Paul Walker always said, speed kills. What? Is it too soon for a for Paul Walker burn? Oh my god. 5.56 derives its strength through fragmentation. As you can see from this gel demo that Winchester put on for us while we were reviewing this gun, the 5.56 creates a devastating wound cavity because the bullet hits hard and faster than 2,500 feet per second and it breaks apart inside soft targets at those speeds. Anything slower than 2,500 feet per second, however, and fragmentation may not occur, resulting in a small but still not fun bullet wound. Thus, as a rule of thumb, M193 will fragment at up to 200 yards from a 20 inch barrel, about 150 yards from a 16 inch barrel, about 100 yards with a 14 and a half inch M4 barrel, and according to the data I've seen, I'd expect around 2600 to 2800 feet per second at the muzzle from a Mark 18 with M193, and around 2800 to almost 3000 feet per second at the muzzle with the Micro Tavor, you're getting a much better chance of fragmentation at 100 yards with the Micro Tavor over the Mark 18. And reason number four, it's truly an ambi gun. Common complaint with a bullpup, not ambidextrous enough. I don't think we should have to cater to 10% of the population, but here we are, or 30% of the population who are cross-eyed dominators. But the Tavor does it. It's got an ambi safety, it's got an ambi mag release, it's got an ambi bolt release, it's more ambi than an octopus like the AR, the Tavor's modular with a full length optic rail up top, and a railed four end with three, six, and nine o'clock pick rail, nice covers also right out of the box. This is an expensive upgrade for something like the AUG. It's also got swappable ejection ports, which is a deal breaker for many bullpups. It's great that the X95 is an ambi rifle, but one downside of having the ambi swappable ejection port is if you shoot with a suppressor with sufficient back pressure, you might end up with a little bit of carbon on your face. This is exactly what happened to me when I was shooting this at Thunder Ranch, of course. I'm like this for almost an hour. Ryan doesn't say a word to me about it while I'm walking around Thunder Ranch looking like I just blew an 86 Bonneville muffler to completion. That sounds good. Oof. <laughs> Uh, it's a little toasty. It's a little toasty. Felt it through these gloves. Jamie, you got something. Why, why would you not f***ing tell me that? Why would you not f***ing tell Why would you just let me f***ing talk to the camera? God, I would have f***ing... Manicore Arms makes gasketed ejection port covers that prevent this from happening while also adding a QD sling swivel point there. So I ordered one for the next trip out to the range, haven't had a chance to try it yet. I'll try to remember to drop links to all this stuff in the description, by the way. 
So to be fair, the Tavor, like the M4, doesn't have an adjustable gas system, and it's about as gassy as the M4. Also, while the gun can swap ejection port sides, if you need to shoot offhand, you're still catching brass bukkake in your face. Another negative. Oh, another thing. The charging handle moves a little bit, but it doesn't fold out of the way. This can kind of screw with your support hand if you're trying to rest the gun on a hard object. At least it's not a reciprocating charging handle like you have in the AK-47. It doesn't bounce every time you fire because that would be a real problem. Fortunately, again, aftermarket to the rescue, Manicore, again, they make something called the switchback charging handle. I've used that on the AUG before. I bought one for my X95. I'm going to give it a try. I'm sure it's going to be great because it's excellent on the AUG, but I haven't installed it yet. Now, reason number five, cold hammer forged barrel. The X95 has a one and seven inch twist cold hammer forged barrel, which is actually more common with imported AKs than with ARs. You can get a hammer forged AR barrel from a company like Daniel Defense or Bravo Company, but those won't be cheap. It's a paid upgrade. Cold hammer forging means the barrel is going to be more durable over time than a button rifled or non hammer forged barrel. I've talked about this in previous videos. Go check Wikipedia or something if you want to know more. Related to that, reason number six great accuracy and optics options. Gonna lump this into one big Easter basket, or I guess Abraham basket or something, if you're watching this from Tel Aviv. I'm not really big on propriety, but with this review, I did what I thought was the proper thing. I configured the X95 with the MeproLite M21. M21, it was developed for the IDF as the standard optic for the Devor in the mid-90s. It's an Israeli-made no-magnification reflex sight that uses dual illumination. It's got this fiber optic collector on top of the optic here for gathering ambient light, and it's got a tritium vial inside to illuminate the sight in darkness. It's a good end of the world optic for a Tavor for two reasons. One, built like a tank, and it's famous for being one of the toughest optics you can buy. And two, the illumination doesn't need batteries. The fiber optics will draw brightness from sunlight, while the tritium will give you over 10 years of radiation-based illumination in total darkness. Quick life hack, if it's super bright outside and your reticle is getting so bright that it's actually washing out your target, you can just place your hand over the fiber optic collector on top to temporarily bring down the illumination, or you can use a strip of tape. Obviously, I'd prefer an electronically illuminated reticle or a holographic sight because those optics are a little bit sharper, easily adjustable brightness settings, but then you have to worry about batteries. It's heavy at 13 ounces, a quarter pound heavier than your average EOTech, but it meets or exceeds mil standard 810 standards for durability. It's got this huge 30 millimeter objective lens. It costs less than $450, including the quick disconnect mount, which is very cheap. It's also NVG compatible and it'll work with a 3X magnifier. It's not perfect, but it's damn good, especially at that price. Can you use the M21 on an M4? Absolutely, but it might not be the best choice for the AR-15 because of the weight and the size. 13 ounces, quite a bit, but it works well with the Tavor because of this, again, aft center of gravity on the X-95. You hardly notice the additional weight right here as you might with an AR. That all said, any reflex optic that has no magnification isn't going to be worth a damn for shooting groups at 100 yards, but I'm glad to report that shooting the 3 inch and the 6 inch swinging plates in the Adam Brown range at 100 yards with the X95, way too easy using the M21. Okay, we rolling? So now we're going to try to shoot with the M21, which is a no magnification optic at 300 yards, shooting a 5 foot 8 inch tall man. And we're going to see how well the micro Tavor shoots at that distance. Perfect hit, slightly left. Same spot. Exact same spot, about five inches high. Slightly right at Four. the belt line. In the kneecap, right side. All right, all right. Right in the dick. Was that all hits? Yeah, they oh, were shit. Those hit. 
Okay, so we didn't miss at 300 yards at, at all with this thing. So um, I'm gonna say it's good to go. It's pretty nice to be able to have something this compact. And I, I was holding on the chest and making hits on the chest at 300. So, I mean, that's a nice thing whenever you've got a bull pup. We've got a lot of barrel here, notwithstanding the fact that this is like probably smaller than an MP5. Also, remember that the IDF said that their Tavors were more accurate than the M4. IDF must stand for, I don't can believe it for me, but we'll post that one on the board in favor of the X95 just for the sake of argument. Oh yeah. And if you don't feel like buying an optic, the X95 comes with really good flip out irons from the factory. They seamlessly integrate and tuck away in this rail, really cool feature. Front sight also has a glow in the dark tritium vial. And by the way, the irons were perfectly zeroed to 100 yards from the factory. Really impressive. I said it in the beginning of this video, I was anti bullpup for quite a while, but I've made a complete turnaround after getting the AUG. The advantages of the bullpup outweigh the costs in my estimation. You get a lot shorter overall length with a longer barrel, you get a great rearward center of gravity. Mag changes are a little bit clumsier, yeah, but the difference is marginal with designs like the X95. Triggers are also a problem for bullpups, but third-party options these days make bullpup triggers as good or better than what you might find in most AR-15s. Price is always going to be a sticking point, as you can get a capable AR-15 for a thousand bucks or less, while the X95 has a two thousand dollar MSRP. That all said, Street price for this gun usually runs closer to $1,600, and considering this is a battle-proven design made with premium components, cold hammer forged barrel, quad rail, built-in backup iron sights, not to mention using a piston operating system that's much costlier to manufacture than direct impingement, you can drop 2K and still walk with the M21 optic and the gun, and that's less than what most premium ARs are going to run you without an optic. So am I. James J. Reeves, am I going to swap out my AR-15s for the pups? Absolutely not. But at this point, I own five or six bull pups, and that number's only going up because of how impressed I've been with the ones that we've been getting in the U.S. What we're seeing over here are designs that have already been combat proven, like the AUG, the VHS, the Tavor, all excellent specimens. You're talking like X-Files Jillian Anderson versus Teenage Dream music video Katy Perry versus 1998 Anna Kornikova, 1999 Anna Kornikova, yeah, 1999, 1999 Anna Kornikova. If you were looking to buy a bullpup, do you get the X95 or the AUG or the VHS? The answer is yes. I can tell you with 100% confidence that you should just literally pick out the one that you like the best and go with it. You'll probably be happy. They certainly all have their differences, but we'll save that for another video soon. Stay tuned. Gang, we are viewer supported. I did not get money from IWI or Meprolite or anybody to make this video. We do it because of your contributions on Patreon, Subscribestar, and Utreon. If you support us on Subscribestar or Utreon, you are entered to win one of four free guns every single month and one of four Blue Alpha $100 gift certificates. Rules are in the description, and I've also got a link posted below here. I want to say thank you to our sponsors, Top Gun Supply. If you need something from IWI, go check out Top Gun Supply. And if you need ammo to feed it, make sure to check out Ventura Munitions, our trusted sponsor for years now. But most of all, thank you again just for watching and take care, everyone.